so welcome to top numbering or as my colleague Bonnie calls it how the records talk to each other before we actually start talking about top numbering I just want to acknowledge country in the spirit of reconciliation New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land sea and community we pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So basically, where are we going? So we're going to look at why you might need to know about top numbering, some things to keep in mind, some definitions, how the system works. We'll look at some examples also the importance of actually recording where you've been and mapping your steps in case you have to actually turn around and go backwards. How to find letter numbers in places other than the indexes. Some of the complications and what I particularly want you to remember when you come to visit us to look at top numbering. So why do you need to know top numbering? Well, obviously everything that's held by state archives is listed on their website. Well, no, it's not. And even if all the files and items were listed, a file can actually be made up of hundreds of letters. And these will be listed in the contemporary top number registers and the let registers of letters received and the indexes to the letters of registers received. So you do need to know about top numbering. If you want to research land purchases, particularly, I think that's where most people come into contact with top numbering. When they're doing a conditional purchase, or any other form of land tenure. But you might also want to research the miscellaneous and parks branch of land. And in there, you'll find information on parks, cemeteries, commons. You might also want to do the early surveyor general's records looking at gold fields. Now, we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to the late Joan Rees, who in her own time came in and indexed the colonial secretary's, chief secretary's papers up to 1894 and since then her daughter and Aileen Trinder have completed it to 1896. Um, but she was primarily interested in people. So if you're wanting to use Chief Secretary's papers after 1896 or you're looking for a topic that maybe Joan didn't cover, then you will need to know about top numbering. So if your topic's a bit different, if it's not straightforward, if it's hidden from plain view, you may need to know about top numbering. So the first question you need to ask yourself is how is the state government involved in your topic? So the state archives is a very specific place. We hold the records of the decisions and actions of the New South Wales government. We're not a general local history library. We're not a general family history uh, organ organization. We are specifically here to keep the records of the state archives accessible and to preserve them. So top numbering is a system for controlling correspondence so that it can be found again. And it's also a system for grouping correspondence on the same topic together. So what happens? Basically, a member of the public, another agency writes a letter to a government department. It comes into the office, it's opened by a clerk, it's given the next number and that number comes from the registers of letters received. Then information about the letter is entered up into that register. It could be the date it was received, the date it was sent, the name of the person who sent it, a little bit about the subject. And it's also ended up in the index to letters received. So from the point of view of the agency, it actually makes perfect sense because basically what they had is they had all their correspondence around them, their present current correspondence, plus the back file for each one of those letters. And it's kind of funny that you've got this system which the government is using to find letters and we're finding it very hard to use that system to find those same letters. But often I think that's because we're actually running the system in reverse. We're actually often finding a very early letter number and trying to go forward in time, whereas the system seems to work better going backwards in time. 
So thinking outside the square number two, what I'm basically saying to you is that top looking for correspondence requires patience and time because of top numbering. It's not instantaneous unless Joan Rees has already listed it, in which case you can come in and say, I want this letter. You may actually have to go through decades of registers and indexes to find letters on your topic. We're more used to modern subject file based files. And in the 20th century, there are quite a few agencies that are more project based. So for example, we have um, Department of Main Roads where they'll actually be building a particular road. And that will be, that file will all have the same number about that road. So it's a different way of thinking and you really need to get your head around it, I think, to understand it. So it's a simple system, but it's made complex by the length of time the file covers. It's logical, but it's also illogical to our point of view. It's systematic, but if anything goes for 150 years, there are always going to be exceptions. The gain is worth the pain. I can't guarantee that. It may be worth the pain, but there are no guarantees of success. And I'd like to get you to think about it as being like pass the parcel in reverse. So every time the music stops, instead of a piece of paper being taken off, another letter is added. But where will the game end? Where will the parcel and file finally end up? So let's look at some of the definitions in letters. Basically letters that come into a department. They could be come in from an individual, another government agency. And these files are always going to be the original. So if your ancestor wrote a letter to the, a department and we have it, then your ancestor's signature may be on it. Now, the opposite to this are the out letters. The out letters are sent by the department to an individual or to another government agency. And therefore the original has gone and what we hold is always going to be a copy. There are different methods of copying over time. In the very early time periods, a clerk had to actually rewrite the letter into a volume. And sometimes particularly like with uh, colonial secretary, chief secretary, they had different volumes for different sections they were writing to so that like material would be together. A change in technology is the letterpress books. Now letterpress books are extremely fragile. It's like a very, very thin tissue paper that was pressed upon a wet, a copy of, sorry, pressed upon the original letter just after it had been written so that it blotted up the ink and made a copy. It's like a very early photocopy if I want a better word, but the paper is exceptionally thin and sometimes the ink in the letters has eaten out little bits of the paper. And finally, of course, we come to technologies such as carbon paper and typewriters. And often by the time you get to this time period, you'll actually get your letters sent out actually in the same file as the letters that have come in. So the second thing we're going to look at is the numbering. The letters are given a number mostly they're going to be an annual running number. So what does that mean? Well, the first year number is the year. And so if you ever look at um, Joan Rees's index, for example, you'll see that there's two numbers at the beginning of each letter, and that is not always the year that the letter was received. And the second number is that next available number. So it's the number that's actually allotted to the letter. And it's a unique number, so each letter has with a couple of exceptions, a unique number. So for example, 40 slash 1234, that should be the 1,234th letter received by that department in the year 40, 1940, 1840. Now, when the number is the top number in a file, then that letter is where the letter will be in the container. By, so the first letter and then the second letter sorry, the first number and then the second number. There is also what's called a classified number. And with a classified number, you get a subject entry. So you often see three numbers in this. An example is 40 slash 24 slash 1234. It's still the 1234th letter 
in the year 40, but it's been given this subject number of 24. So again, you will find that in the box at 1234 within 1840 or 1940, and the middle number is silent. And of course, there are always exceptions to this, and some departments do actually do things that are slightly different. Now, special bundles. In Queensland, they call them special batches. So a special bundle is when a number of related files are brought together on a topic, and often they will be very, very large indeed. And if you have a look at our list of special bundles on our website, you'll think to yourself, but they're not running in date order. They are, but it's actually the end date and not the start date. So if you look down this list, you'll see it's 1907, 9, 9, 11, 11, 14, 15, and 15, which is a different way of thinking about things. I'm sorry, every time I look at this photo, I want to give that woman an ergonomic chair. I really do. Anyway, modern health and safety ideas. So how does top numbering work? Well, one clue is in the fact that it's also known as forward filing. So step one, a letter comes into the office and it's given that next available number that's in the letters received register. Step two, the letter is written up in the letters received register. Step three, we get an entry into the index under the name of the person or the department who wrote the letter. It may also be indexed under the name of the person, a person named in the letter or under the subject. And the index will give you that allocated number. Step four, the letter is filed at its allocated annual running number. So far, fairly straightforward. This is where it starts to get complicated. So a second letter is received on the same topic or person. Again, the letter comes into the office and it's given the next available number in the letters, registered, letters received register. Now the letter may have come in a week later, it may have come in a month later, it may have come in a year later, it could have come in decades later and it gets the next number at that time. So the new letter is written up in the letters received register the prior letter on the same topic or person is retrieved from the files and pinned underneath the new letter. The new letter number is written at the bottom of the page of the prior letter. The entry for the prior letter in the letters received register is changed to show that the prior letter is now filed at a new number. The new letter is entered into the index and it may also be entered under the name of the person who's in the letter as well as the department or the person who wrote it. The index entry for the prior letter is also now amended so that the new letter number is added. And now, this is the really important point, the new letter and the prior letter are now both filed together at the new number. So the file has moved forward. And this is repeated again and again and again until the files matter is resolved or the file is closed. Now, I don't want you to stress about this. We're not gonna bail you up at the door and say you cannot enter the reading room until you can tell me what step seven is of the top numbering system. And sometimes getting your head around this is a bit difficult. I think it's, it's a lot like swimming, frankly. You can go to as many lectures as you like you can read as many books as you like, but until you get in the water and start doing, you don't really tend to understand. So if you come to the reading room, you wanna research some land, the staff on the reading room desk are there to help you and to show you how this system works. So please do not stress about top numbering. So let's start to look at some of our examples. This is the Surveyor General's in letter 1856, number 1451. It's from the Colonial Secretary to the Commissioner of Crown Lands, approving the payment for expenses incurred in enclosing the sand hill of Pural or Puvral as a place of internment for the Aborigines of the Lower Darling District. So this file is made up of two pieces of paper. There's the actual letter 56-1451 
underneath it is a note to say that letter 56-119 is related but has not been retained in the office. Now there are numbers all over these. So in yellow I've outlined the actual letter number that it was filed at. But you'll notice the colonial secretary in his letter has actually put his out letter number, which is 50. There is a reference to a prior colonial secretary's in number, 56-1151. And on 56-119, there's a reference to a CC Commissioner of Crown Lands letter, number 42. So the records are referring back to each other as you go through. And once you start to notice these numbers, they'll really jump out at you. So as mentioned, the letters will be entered up into the letters received register. And I've tried to make it clear to you where those letters are by using the same numbers. So you'll see that for entry 56-119, that letter is over on the column called progressive. However, over on the results, you get written the next letter number, which is 56-1451. When you go to the entry for 56-1541, you see that number. Now you'll notice they've only put the 56 up the top, but it is implied that it, all those letters will be 56. In the papers, you've got the prior letter number, which is very faint, but it is 56-119 from whom, when they've said the colonial secretary, they've very nicely put in the colonial secretary's out letter number for you. So there's another clue so that you can go there. It tells you who the letter is from, their residence, the date, when the papers were registered, it tells you the nature of the application. And this can actually be very useful for figuring out if this is the letter you want. So 1451 is an Aboriginal burial, burial ground, Lower Darling district, approval for account of fencing at 11 pounds. And then it tells you the result of the application. The letter above is put by, the letter we're interested in says, implies that it's gone to coal, but we know in fact this has been put by and is in the box. So we can go and find the colonial secretary's out letter number 50. And again, this has ended up into a, vo a volume. It's a copy, so it's, rewritten copy, it's not the original because the original has gone to the Commissioner of Crown Lands. It's indexed and the index tells us the page number. It shows us the Colonial Secretary's in letter number 561151. So we can now follow that one up. And again, it refers to the Commissioner for Crown Lands letter number 42. So we can go to the Colonial Secretary's correspondence then and we can see the letter which talked about wanting the account to be paid for the fencing. And now we've got the Colonial Secretary's in letter number 56-1151. We've got a reference to the Surveyor General's letter number, and we've got a reference to the Commissioner of Crown Lands number. So all of these letters are tying themselves to each other by mentioning these numbers that we can then follow up if we need to. So here's an, another example, which is from the Chief Secretary's letters of 1906. So these are in letters. Now here the top number is mentioned at the top of the page, but on the bottom of the prior letter, it's also written in slightly um, skew if, so that it doesn't get confused with the, the top number. And therefore the, you can see a link between these letters. And the earlier letters would file directly underneath and be pinned to the top number and they would be stored, all the letters would be stored together in the container at the top number. Now these letters are all from a local member of parliament. And basically they're asking for a railway pass for James Aubrey Sloggett, a working man here and a very decent fellow of poor means and married. And he wants to travel from Dubbo to Prince Alfred Hospital and back again for a nose operation. Obviously he hasn't got the means to do it. And it also includes a doctor's letter. And here we see how those letters are written up in the letters received register for the chief secretary in 1906. And again, I've tried to link the colors. 
So letter 17560 refers to the fact that the next letter is 16502 and over in the remarks column you've got put by but underneath that you've got the letter number. And again 18502 you've got both the previous letter number and the next letter number and over in the remarks column you've got put by but then the number it's gone to. And then for 19753 you've got the previous number and it, this time it is put by. There is no further letters in this file so that's where it ends up at 19753. Now here's the index and again JA Sloggett, a pass and order and the three numbers are given. There is a lot of great social history in these Chief Secretary's correspondence registers and letters. So for example L Slater, Dr Mayer has written about the burial of him. J Simmons is wanting admission to an eye hospital. I think it's T or F Sinia is an old aid pensioner who has died and someone is seeking a voucher to pay for his burial. J A Simmons possibly an employee is asking for a transfer to the Justice Department and Mrs B Simpson looks as though she's also an employee because it's talking about extended leave and requesting compensation and so on and so forth. So a lot of good social unused information in these registers. Now here is an example from a page of the actual index. So as well as being under J.A. Sloggett's name, it's also going to be under police passes. But look at some of those other headings. So pension board, justice of police, police protection, votes, missing friends, miscellaneous reports. And right down on the bottom of the second page, it says if you want information on strikes, go to page, I think it's 806. Huge amounts of information in these registers, index and letters. So we've used some terminology now that we didn't define beforehand. So this is a good place to actually stop and do that. So for example, one of the things you'll keep coming up with is put by, put away, away or filed. Or sometimes the remarks column on the right hand side is just left blank. What this means is that the letter has actually been filed at the number that was allocated to it when it came into the office. So all letters are actually technically put by each time the matter is considered resolved or closed. But basically a new letter on the topic reactivates the case. It wakes up the file and therefore until it is resolved or closed once more. So then you'll get a new number in that remarks column and ignore all the other things that are written and just concentrate on that last number. There are complications, there always are with archives. Files may also be sent to another government agency and the name of the agency will be in that column. And if that agency has then given it a new number, then trying to find out when it came back to the original agency can become complicated, particularly if the second agency's registers have not survived. And finally, you may go through this entire process and get to the end and have that lovely little red stamp that says destroyed. And that means it was destroyed by the creating agency. In this case, this file was destroyed in 1926. But don't forget you've got the, if you've got a register of letters received, it's telling you what was said in each one of these letters. So that may be the only evidence that you have that some actions or activities took place. And I just had to throw this in, which Bonnie found for me, which is the office layout. And this is the land agent office at Mudgee. You've got the register stand, you've got the pigeonholes, and yes, that's what they're called, the pigeonholes for all the letters to go into. You've got the map stand, and it does sort of make us think about how technology has changed the way our offices are laid out, and, or perhaps has always influenced them. Now, it's vitally important that as you go through this process, you actually record where you've been. So when you go into the registers, take down the information that you found there, who the letter was from, the date, what number it's gone through and chart it in some ways. Um, 
I want to thank Dr. Carolyn Ford for allowing me to use this image of herself looking at those one of those letter received indexes and aren't they large and also for how she actually charted her research. Uh, she went through the miscellaneous branch registers and indexes for material on Sydney beaches. And as she has put in the side there, she spent 70 days researching, 412 individual request slips, 48% success rate from 1920 to 1939, but only a 25 to 30% success rate from 1885 to 1906. I guess numbers, letters are being moved forward. So this is one reason why you may not get success in the earlier time period that you get in the later time period. I also asked one of our uh, researchers, Stephen, who comes in and does land three or four times a month. And he said his success rate is about 60 to 70% that he will actually find the letter in the box. So please bear this in mind when you come in that it may be long and torturous and you may not get anything at the end. So where else do you find the numbers other than the original index? You'll find them all over the registers and cards that record land tenures, such as conditional purchase. You'll find them on Crown plans and they're actually a really good shortcut with a few um, caveats. You'll find them in New South Wales Government Gazette notices. It's really, really important that when you take down these numbers from any of these sources, that you don't just look at the number. You also look at the letters both before and after the number because the letters before indicate which branch of the lands department created the letter. So CS, I know we're mostly familiar with it meaning colonial secretary, but it's also a conditional sales branch, tenure, tenure branch, ML, miscellaneous branch, MS or MISC, which is miscellaneous branch, which later became parks branch, which is PKS or sometimes just P. Now, sometimes you can get that suffix under after a number, and often that's because the department actually had two runs of correspondence, each with the same set of numbers. So if you actually end up in the wrong box, you're not going to find your letter. So sometimes these are DEP for department and COR for correspondence, meaning people from outside the department, or DEP or DEPT for department and IND for individuals. So they're splitting the letters up depending upon whether or not they came from within the department or from outside the department. So here we have a conditional purchase register and it is packed full of numbers. And particularly if you take note of the number at the bottom, which is 04-21701. And we do recommend that when you're doing conditional purchases, you do go through and look at the registers for each one of these numbers. There are some shortcuts, but sometimes these shortcuts do not work. The other thing I want to draw your attention to for this particular one, for William James Symington, is that there are other people involved in this. There's the Bank of New South Wales, which presumably is a mortgage, but then it gets transferred to Albert and William Warner. And then there's the Citibank of Sydney, which again looks as though it's a mortgage. So here is an example of a letter number on a Crown plan. So portion 153, Parish of Exmouth, County of Samden. And this is the Symington uh, Conditional Purchase 78 slash 597 we are just talking about. Now you'll see this time, it's not just saying 04-21701, it's saying CS, Conditional Sales, and it's adding DEP at the end. And that's vitally important for us to know as to which box it's going to be in. But there may not just be one file for this property. There could in fact be two files, one about Symington, one about Warner, or there could in fact be four files with the banks listed as well. With conditional sales and conditional purchase files, the file seems to stop when the portion is transferred to someone else and start again. Stephen mentioned to me that when he was doing one property, he found 36 separate files on that one property. Now, obviously a property is made up the, of more than one portion, but 36 files for the one property, you need to think about that. So here we have some examples again of letter numbers on Crown plans. And this is Parish of Crete, County of Westmoreland near Oberon. 
And we have three letter numbers for William Sloggett's properties. So one is 1879, the second is 1879, but all the other properties are 1901. Because with conditional purchase, you may in fact be purchasing it for a number of years, and that's how long the file will last for. So here we have the conditional branch, sorry, conditional sales branch file, CS01 10777 DEP. And that actually covers 1864 to 1901. And here we have William Sloggett's a letter in 1864. We have a receipt, we have maps, and we have a whole lot of paperwork about the actual um, portions. And there's information on seven CPs, all amalgamated into one file. And that's because the files are not really dealing with land as much. They're dealing with the people who purchase the land. His file also contains a good example of how the file was used in the office, how the letter was used in the office. Personally, I think it looks like a little bit like a frog, an origami frog, but other people have told me no. So basically a lower manager would turn up a corner of the page of the letter and annotate the letter with suggested actions. Later, a supervisor or a senior official would add his recommendations and instructions to that lower manager. And the senior official or the minister has the last say on what's going to happen. So in this case, you've got a double turn up. It's been turned up once with comments written and then it's been turned up again with other comments. And these actions on the back of the page are known as a minute. So the moral of the story is always look on the back of the letter because there may be some important information there. Another example of letter numbers from Crown Plans is emphasising the importance of actually checking the Crown Plan numbers that you find against the letter register. Because with John Douglas's land in the parish of Kurenbong near Dora Creek, our original Crown Plans both say that the letters were put away in 1879 and 1881. But a subsequent Crown Plan says that the letter is in fact conditional sales 93-3294-COR. Why did this happen? Well, when you go and get the file, it covers from 1865 to 1893. And the problem is that the boundaries of the original portions were wrong because of this reserve along the edge of Dora Creek. So the portions had to be resurveyed, and even though the grants had already been issued, the grants had to be reissued. So that's why it's important always to check the letter register to make certain that the letter does actually say it's been put by and that it hasn't been pulled because obviously they didn't go back and amend the original Crown Plan, they just put it on the new Crown Plan. Now I want to look at some of the letter numbers that you can find in the government gazettes. And against, once you start seeing these things, they really pop up at you all the time. So we're looking at the Tumbarumba Cemetery, which was dedicated in 1864. Now on the actual dedication, it's very early and unfortunately there are no letter numbers, but we do have lots and lots of notices in the government gazette about the appointment of trustees. And they do provide us with a lot more letter numbers, an 1888 letter number, an 1895 number, and it's still going. We've still got trustees in 1959, which does indicate that the letter is probably also going to be, sorry, the file is probably also going to be ongoing. So here we have the Tumbarumba Cemetery, and that was actually, this file was found as 1924-5609. It starts in 1863 and it contains material detached from Parks file 42-5566. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. I did not follow through this one through all the way through the registers. I needed an example, so I just went and got a box and looked for the fattest file in the box. But it is a lovely file. Sometimes when we try to show you examples, we want to find you good examples. And a lot of the examples may be basically just lists of trustees, things that you might not be interested in. But this is a very, very good example indeed of why you may want to try and look because you'll never, never know if you never, never look. By 1897, the Tumbarumba Cemetery had a problem. 
basically people were burying their dead on the highest part of the cemetery. But that highest part of the cemetery was actually a road providing access to all the denominational sections. I don't know if you can see it very well, where all the little black things are, there's a red line which is showing the road and then you've got the Wesleyan section. So here we have a letter complaining about the fact that people are burying their dead on the road and they won't listen to the trustees, et cetera, et cetera. So the solution was to redraw the cemetery. So this is a very elegant solution by surveyor A.H. Chesterton, where he's actually changed the road so that the, the burials that have already taken place are now within the general's portion of the cemetery. But what I want to show you is the fact that he has charted where those burials are in this section that was previously the road. He has listed on his little um, plan the references to the graves, whose graves they are, what denomination they were from, and whether or not there is a headstone. Now, only two of these people, Peter Brady and John Lucas, were actually suicides and therefore might have been buried outside of a denominational section. The rest of them, obviously, their relatives just liked the fact they wanted to put them on the hill. And there is a crown plan for this cemetery, and that actually shows the outline of where the roads are going but it makes no reference to the fact that this problem was caused by these graves or where these graves are. So what are some of the complications from top numbering? It's very, very easy to misread the handwritten numbers, um, particularly if you're not used to handwriting and particularly when the staff are trying to fit a lot of information in a very small amount of space. It's not always clear that the information in an entry relates to your letter as the staff will often try to fit extra information either above or below the lines in the register. There are changes to departmental names and functions over time and you really need to do some research on which government agency was responsible for your topic at the time you're looking at. You may find this by in Government Gazette notices which will often have the agency at the top or sometimes, sorry, our website has agency histories of a lot of government agencies because that's a, a very important part of relating the records to the agency that created them. And of course you get format changes. So in the 20th century we moved from volumes to cards and we also for the indexes and the registers of letters received become what are known as file movement registers. And these actually contain much less information. It won't tell you anymore who the letter was from or when it was received. It might just have a one word summary of what the letter is about. We saw one of those, um, a file movement register earlier when we talked about the destroyed record. So what do I want you to remember from today's talk? I think the first and the most important thing is that it is not instantaneous. Finding correspondence, particularly about land, takes time and patience. You may need to make more than one visit. It may take you several days just to go through the registers. You need to use a system to record what you found so you can retrace the numbers if suddenly you end up with a file on Balmain Park when you thought you were tracing Oberon Common. So something's obviously gone wrong there and maybe it's just a misinterpretation of a number. It's important to understand that the department kept the correspondence organised and numbered the way they needed it so they could efficiently do their work. So as I've mentioned, lands department records may not be about the land, the portion itself, so you won't get a lovely little file all about that property from where to go, but they are more in fact about the people who are completing the purchase. So if one person did buy all, get, was granted all of that land, there may be one file. But if the land has changed hands before it was granted, then you may have multiple files for that one portion of land. Now, the New South Wales State Archives commenced in 1961 and we may hold incomplete records. So there are times when we have correspondence, we don't have the index or the register. Or we have the index and the register, but no correspondence. Or we have the register, but no index or correspondence. Very, very important, if the issue is still ongoing, the agency may still have the files. 
there is not some cutoff point where suddenly something turns 30 and it comes out to us. If it's a current issue, the agency still needs to consult that file, then that file may still be with the agency. Dr. Carolyn Ford found this when she was doing her beaches. There are a number of very important beaches that she got to the end of the run and found out we didn't have them and they were still with the agency because that a beach, a park in particular, more so I think than the conditional purchases are still ongoing for decades and centuries. And finally, I've shown you the copies of Crown Plans in this talk, but copies of Crown Plans are only available from the info brokers listed on the New South Wales Land Registry Services. You can certainly come to New South Wales State Archives Reading Room and see those Crown Plans on our New South Wales Land Registry Services kiosk, but we can't give you copies. You have to go back to the info brokers. And I would particularly like to thank New South Wales Land Registry Services for allowing New South Wales State Archives to show images of Crown Plans in our webinar program. I would also like to thank my colleagues who have contributed their ideas to this program and their suggestions, and particularly to Bonnie, who came up with the title, to Rhett and Jeanette for all the help they've given me in hoping to clarify what top numbering is for you. But please remember, do not be afraid. Do not think I can never go to State Archives again. I will do, have to deal with top numbering. We are here in the reading room to help you and guide you through this process.